Hi, my name is Sahar Youssef. I'm a professor at the Haas School of Business at UC Berkeley, and I study productivity from a biological perspective. Uh, my background's in cognitive neuroscience, and so I specifically study how the human brain and the body work best and how we can use uh, that science to apply it to productivity, typically in the workplace, uh, but currently from a work from home setup. So as you might imagine, with the current global climate, uh, we've received numerous uh, questions, uh, concerns, and challenges that people are facing working from home and trying to maintain both uh, efficiency and productivity for their jobs, but also their sanity, and trying to create some semblance of work-life sustainability while they're working at home. So I wanted to address a couple of the common mistakes that we've seen, uh, in addition to that, some, some tips and tricks that you could implement uh, immediately to try and both maintain that productivity, but also, of course, uh, keeping your sanity in check. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes uh, I see people making is uh, immediately just jumping into work first thing in the morning without really having a proper work from home setup. So if you're new to working from home, really having a dedicated space that is the space where you are actually sitting down to work on a daily basis. It's absolutely key. And if you, if space in general is an issue uh, and you don't have the luxury of having uh, an office, um, I myself do not, I work at my dining room table, uh, then use uh, different objects or different uh, what are called cognitive triggers to actually trigger you into a state of work and a brain state of work and then remove that object when the work day is over. Um, I'll be a little bit uh, more clear here. The brain works in uh, many sort of associations. We build these associations with our environments, with uh, smells, with objects, with uh, different types of sen sensory stimuli. We build these associations, and these associations uh, very quickly tell our brains and our bodies what to expect in a certain environment or what state we should really be in. Now, if you're new to working from home, you might imagine that your home is a place where you go to unwind. It's a place where you go to be with friends, with family, and to disconnect. So it can be a little bit jarring in the beginning where you're trying to maintain a professionalism and the same level of rigor and efficiency that you would in your typical office, but you're now in, in, in the place where your brain and your body are associated, associating with relaxation, which is why it's even more critical to have either a dedicated space. If you do not have a dedicated space, use uh, a routine and a trigger to get you into a dedicated space. Uh, things that you could use would be a tablecloth or even a scarf just on the table, where that tablecloth or that scarf becomes associated with work time. When it's time to sit down and actually do some work, you bring out that tablecloth and you can put, put it right there on your kitchen table or your dining table, and now that is your desk. Now that is your workplace. And when you're done, you take it away. Just make sure that, again, you're not cross-listing those cues and those routines with anything apart from work. This way, you're not uh, at the risk of building associations with things that you should not associate, associate with work, but at the same time, you're leveraging this really fun biological phenomenon to actually help you getting into a productive mindset and a focused brain state, as opposed to feeling like you're always at home. Uh, another, I would say, a common mistake I see is being constantly connected to our devices. Now that we're at home and we're feeling rather disconnected from our teams and from our typical workplace, we can start to feel as if we need to prove that we're working, that we are uh, connected and therefore at teams. And the, the most typical manifestation of this is that folks will stay connected to their inbox, they will stay connected to uh, their phones. Uh, all day, trying to be as responsive as possible to make it seem that they're the most supportive they can be for their teams, uh, especially for managers. This will be a likely culprit and a likely outcome. Uh, remote workers have a tendency, according to numerous studies, to actually put in more hours, unfortunately, than folks who actually go into the office. So do not make this very common mistake and set up uh, a remote communication strategy with your team. Uh, let folks know that you're going to be available. Set up an emergency line uh, and also 
please reevaluate your relationship with your notifications. You do not need to be getting notifications for every single message. Uh, both Outlook and Gmail have options where you can set up uh, ostensibly VIP notifications that will ping you if it's your direct supervisor uh, or if it's a client that you cannot miss uh, their message. But everything else will not notify you so that you can choose intentionally when to actually check uh, the inbox. You, and that might be every hour, but it should not be constant. The other thing is your relationship with your actual phone. Um, UT Austin came out with, um, I would say, a rather frightening study in 2018 where they were able to show that just the, 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 the mere presence of your smartphone, even in the off position, even face down and completely off within your line of sight, can actually siphon away cognitive resources and decreases your cognitive bandwidth across a multitude of different uh, cognitive tests. This is everything from tests of general fluent intelligence to complex working memory. So do yourself a favor and make sure that when you're sitting down to do focused work, do not have your phone present in front of you. And definitely do not have your notifications on so that you're not getting constantly interrupted. Every single time there is a digital interruption, there is a cost associated with it. And you pay for it both in time, the time that it takes you to typically do your work, and you also pay for it in energy. It will take more energy cognitively, neurologically, and physiologically for you to get your work done if you're getting interrupted and you keep task or context switching. You switch into the inbox and then back to your work at hand. So do yourself a favor, make sure that you're either on do not disturb or have your notifications turned off, get out of your inbox before you sit down to do focused work, and make sure that you have your phone either in a different room, across the room, but also off. Um, one uh, neat trick that we're doing in my household is that we have a phone basket. Uh, if you don't have a basket, go to the kitchen and grab a bowl. Designate it with a post-it note and say, you know, this is the phone location. It's a phone drop-off station. So that before you sit down to actually get focused work done at home, it's, it's everywhere. Everyone in your household can drop their phones into the bowl or the basket, and it becomes a ritual. And if you forget to do this, because many times it, it can be um, too tempting to want to check the news, especially in uh, the climate right now. We want to stay connected and informed about what's going on. But there are no prizes for getting news 10 minutes faster or an hour faster than you would otherwise. So do your own future sanity um, a favor and make sure that you have a designated location for a phone to live when you're sitting down to do focused work and you can check it on the hour if you need to. And even on your phone, set up VIP calls where if loved ones are calling and you do need to get that call, uh, it would be an emergency otherwise, those calls will come through, but otherwise everything else is on do not disturb and the notifications are off. Um, those would be the two biggest uh, mistakes I see folks making is having those blurred associations between work and personal and personal and work and not having clear physical boundaries between the two, but also cognitive boundaries between the two. So creating rituals and routines so that you can have clear distinctions between when it's work and when it's home, uh, all within the same location. And the other is the constant connectivity. You must embrace asynchronous communication. You cannot stay constantly connected to your devices and to communicating with your team. You must embrace asynchronous communication if your team is now just gone fully remote. Uh, the next question that I get most often uh, is, how should we be working now that we are working from home? How should our teams be operating? And the answer to that is to embrace doing what's called a focus sprint. Um, my research team and I uh, train countless teams, both remote and in person, uh, on how to do focus sprints. Now, a focus sprint is a methodology of work. It is a how of working, uh, typically in 60 to a maximum 90 minute increment. And it's not what you're working on, but again, it is how you are working. It is a dedicated block of time dedicated and blocked in your calendar where you sit down and actually do focused work uh, and then take a break at the end. I'll go through the steps very, very briefly, um, and I'm happy to, to sort of share a lot of follow-up resources if anyone needs it. We can make sure our university is here for you uh, during this time to troubleshoot and really figure out ways that you can work uh, that will be beneficial not only to you from a productivity standpoint, but also beneficial to you from a biological standpoint. 
Now, a focus sprint, step number one, is to actually intentionally set aside the time in your calendar. Uh, this does a couple of things, but the most important thing that it does is it actually communicates to the people that you work with that you are not available during that time, that you are doing focused work, they know that you're working, but you're not expected to be responsive during that time. It's very important. You need to make sure everyone is on the same page, that they know that you're not going to be responsive during that, that hour, let's say, that you've set aside. And that shared language is now created with everyone on the team. They know what focus sprint means, and they know to not expect a response from you. Step number two, eliminate distractions. Set up your environment for success. Again, make sure that your phone is not nearby. Make sure your notifications are turned off. Uh, make sure that the only thing open on your, on your screen digitally is only the tabs and the pieces of information that are relevant for the task at hand. Again, goes without saying, you do not have email open, you do not have Slack open or any other communication tools open. And again, the only pieces of uh, information and data that you might need to actually sit down to do that task at hand is open. So you don't have a lot of different tabs open all at once. Um, and make sure that your environment uh, is set up for success. You don't have um, a lot of visual and auditory noise around you. Our bodies and our brains are, are hardwired to constantly scan the environment for lions, tigers, and bears. Uh, we are constantly scanning for threat. You cannot fight that. You have to embrace it. So knowing that, make sure that you're wherever it is that you've designated to be your work from home setup, that it's not in a heavily uh, traversed area by folks in your home so that it doesn't have a lot of foot traffic. Um, Honestly, you could just turn around and, and stare at a wall, um, work in your closet if you need to, um, put up, um, you can actually thumbtack or nail a, a basic bed sheet to the, from the ceiling and hang it down to create almost a, a makeshift partition or a wall so that you can visually protect your environment so that you don't see people walking by and you're not being interrupted. If you do have a lot of folks, especially if you have kids, make sure that there's some sort of, you need to get on the same page with your kids and everybody in your home, that they know when you're sitting down to do a focus sprint, you are not to be disturbed and you are not available during that time. Have either a do not disturb sign or signal, um, and better yet, get everyone involved in the process. Maybe that could be a designated playtime with a certain activity that kids could do also for 60 minutes. Have a daily stand-up with them where they have a routine and they know exactly what's happening when, and they're there to, everyone is supporting each other to do something on their own for that hour. So again, make sure your environment is set up for success. Make sure that you have headphones in to block and protect um, your auditory cortex from a lot of distraction. Uh, in terms of listening to music while you are working, make sure that if there are lyrics, uh, lyric list would be, would be uh, great, but if you do prefer music with lyrics in it, make sure that it's in a language you do not speak. Otherwise, you will be processing. You will be background processing all of those words. And it, again, will siphon away cognitive resources from the task at hand. Noise canceling headphones would be phenomenal, but it's not necessary. You can absolutely use any headphones that you might have available, and you don't actually need to listen to music either. It's only if you prefer. Uh, using anything just to block out uh, noise from your environment uh, will do great in just keeping you focused and making sure that, again, you're not background processing unnecessary stimuli during this time. Uh, the next step is to actually write down what you aim to accomplish and be very clear in that writing. Uh, write it down with on a pen and a piece of paper or a post-it if you can. Be very clear in scoping out what work you aim to accomplish. Be very, very clear. I would say one of the biggest mistakes with focus sprints is uh, folks sitting down and saying, oh, sure, I'm going to do a focus sprint. It's in the calendar. They're doing all of the other steps. But what they say to themselves is, I'm going to sit down and get a lot of work done. The problem here is that Work is never really done, now is it? When will we know when we can reward ourselves with a job well done at the end of a focus sprint? Because of that, it becomes exceedingly important to scope out very, very clearly what it is that you aim to accomplish by the end of the sprint. What is the work product or the work outcome? Now take that, that project that you're working on or that work product and break it down into smaller subtasks and time estimate and time block how, how long it will take to do each one of those subtasks, even if they're five minutes a piece. So actually scope out what you aim to accomplish very, very clearly so that you know when you are actually done, when you're successful and you can check that off of the list and get that you know, hit of dopamine that will keep you energized and motivated and happy to continue doing work. Otherwise, we have a tendency to jump into work without intentionality 
And then we work for hours and hours and hours without really feeling like we've accomplished what we set out to accomplish. So really make sure you scope out the work. Uh, the next piece is use a timer. Actually set a timer. And you don't have to use a phone timer for this. There are extensions you can use online. Use any other physical timer if you can. But actually time box the amount of time. You can't do a focus sprint all day. It, it defeats the purpose. Then it's not a sprint. So when you sit down, actually set a timer uh, and make sure that you're, you're time blocking. It's one of the best productivity techniques um, I could uh, recommend. Uh, and the last step is to take a break. Do not forget to take a break. And this is not just you know about work-life sustainability, but taking a break, a true cognitive break, will actually allow your brain and your body to physiologically create uh, gluc your glucocorticoids again. These are stress hormones in the body like cortisol and adrenaline. It'll allow your body to actually biologically prepare to continue to do more work afterwards. If you do not take a break and you continue to forge ahead, you can start to become very exhausted and fatigued as the day wears on, and you'll be completely uh, burned out by day's end when now you need to have that energy to actually put towards your own personal life, to spend time with your family. So remember to take a break, and I will just very quickly define a full cognitive break. A cognitive break is defined as a break of time in which you are not processing information. Remember, the brain is a muscle. The muscle needs to rest in between sets, just like you would at the gym. So actually take a full cognitive break and do not, don't read, don't write, don't scroll through social media. Actually make sure that you're not processing information. Refuel, rehydrate, and then get back to work. Uh, move your body as much as possible. Um, you know, sit in front of the window as much as you can to get actual sunlight. Now that, that we're all indoors, these are, these are, all of these things are very important. And the last piece of advice um, I'd like to give is about chronotypes. Every human being has a biological chronotype. Uh, this is, um, in layman's terms, whether or not you're a morning bird or a night owl. Uh, most of the human population is what's called biphasic. These are folks that will ramp up sort of early, um, or I would say late afternoon um, and late uh, morning as well. So you have kind of two humps throughout the day where you're very focused uh, cognitively at your best and physiologically at your best. Know what your chronotype is. Know when your peak performance hours are and carve out that time, protect that time as much as possible to do the cognitively intensive high value work during that time as much as possible because you will get much more done with much more ease during your peak performance hours than you would any other time of day. Uh, so know your chronotype, protect those hours, do focus sprints. That is the number one piece of advice I could give. Make sure that you don't have blurred associations between work and, and home uh, and create designated space. Have physical objects that can work as triggers, even musical playlists that you can listen to, that this is your work playlist and then you do not listen to that music otherwise. Um, have some sort of uh, physical object that reminds you that this is now designated work time and remember to remove those objects when it's not designated work time. And uh, remember to not be constantly connected. Digital hygiene is the number one mistake folks make when they're newly working from home. You need to have time away from your phone, from your devices. You need to have off hours. Uh, I always say if we do not have off, there's no such thing as on. You are not bringing 100% of yourself to your work if you do not have designated off as well. So make sure that you have good digital hygiene. Make sure that you you have your notifications off when you're when you're sitting down to work and you're not in your inbox. And most importantly, rest. Be safe. Uh, find moments of time to to have gratitude. Breathe deeply. Move your body. And please stay safe during this time. We are all uh, in this together. It's we're all jumping into the unknown, uh, but we're we're here as a global race together uh humanity is going to be is going to have to work together to get through this and we will uh, and be safe uh, from my family to yours thank you